Hello, everybody. Um, I, I think that when the composition of, of the meeting and the call was put out, um, I, it seemed like a good idea to talk back to this piece that is coming out of world development. Some of you may have seen that, and I'm, I'm hoping that it, I'm going to offer you a little bit more than what you get in the text. Um, the purpose of, of that paper was, in fact, to try and mark out uh, an urban agenda in the world development community which has typically been quite spatially blind um, at what is really quite a critical moment. And I'm hoping that what I have to say helps us, I, I doubt, given the people in the room, that there's going to be anything I say where you haven't actually thought of that before or were, in some cases, not yourself actively involved in either saying it or when it was originally <coughs> said. Yeah. But what I, what I hope to be able to do is to provide a, a platform where we can either bounce off what I'm going to say or uh, react uh, to it or take that stuff for granted so that we can move on and, and, and begin to kind of take things forward. So in essence, part of what I want to start off by pointing out is, is that I'm taking this as a moment of fundamental importance for the urban agenda. Um, a period of time where, which is not to say there's never been an urban agenda, and we'll come back to that, or that this is it and that it is fixed, but rather that what the SDGs represent and what SDG 11, where you see the little star, represents is this very significant political game or opening that we need, we fought for, and having got it, be careful what you wish for, because now, in a sense, you have to populate things from here. And I'm not conflating the urban agenda with God 11. Um, in fact, I think there is much, as many have pointed out, which comes from some of the other goals, perhaps goal 17 on the means of implementation might even turn out to be more important. Uh, but it's, it's symbolic in some senses. and. Um, Work. Is this me? Okay, there you go. Um, the other thing, I, and this is a caveat slide, okay? I think one of the things that we have to be able to acknowledge is that insofar as we might talk about a global consensus that cities are important, which is what I'm suggesting, it is not the same thing as saying that because the UN said that there's a globally important urban agenda, we have an urban agenda. Yeah? I think it's symbolic of, it represents, and here's the rug, a consensus view of nation states. And one of the things I'm going to go on to do is to try and say, when that many people say that they agree, you can absolutely guarantee that when you begin to start implementing, the first thing that's going to happen is that you're going to have a fight about what it will, is that you need to. Um, and the UN, is a consensual body, that's how it operates, it reaches agreement, and it's a negotiated text, and it is therefore, by definition, fluffy and vague. Yeah? So, that caveat aside. Similarly, because of the way the UN works, I don't, it's a particular moment, and you'll all be familiar with this, that it's not just the SDG process, but because Habitat happens to be the first of these big conferences that are in the next round of the UN deliberations, there's this almost back-to-back -back discussion about we've got a new urban SDG and now we're going to get the definition of a new document in Habitat 3 and together in some senses these will culminate and represent a point in the mid-2010s where the urban, I think, assumes a kind of a a particular prominence and, and an urban agenda of a, perhaps a different kind rolls out from there. But to suggest that that is a moment in time and it's these three or four years is exactly what I want to answer. Um, and to suggest that there is a longer history that we need to understand and that history is important because understanding how we got to here enables us to understand what may be possible going forwards. That said, I don't want to underestimate the moment. Okay? I, think, I think to poo-poo the fact that this is a dramatic and a significant transformation is something we should be celebrating. 
It's something which is, in my view, undoubtedly an advance. It makes it easier to make a case for cities. It makes it easier to have a case that we need to know what the case for cities is, and that we need to know whose interests cities serve in important kinds of ways. And already, it seems to me, that the SDG is symbolic of a watershed. I don't like the catchphrase that goes with it. I, mean, I don't like it when it gets abbreviated to cities and, and, and sustainable communities. I don't like that catchphrase, and I certainly don't like make cities safe, inclusive, sustainable, and resilient. Um, I think it's going to date terribly, I think it's ambiguous, I think horror into those kinds of things. That said, it seems to me that there are some really important reasons which we should acknowledge that are different already. And the first is, is that in the SDGs as a whole, we have moved to a universal agenda. Now this, the UN in theory has always endorsed the universal agenda. Okay? The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the UN's declaration, and it's a declaration, it's very much located in the individual. And I think what the SDGs now do is because they argue that these standards will apply to everybody, whether you talk about the health SDG, or the education SDG, or the water SDG, in, in theory, they apply to everybody. So whether you are the poorest resident of Kigali, or whether you're living in Chicago, the minimal standards that are set are the aspirations for everybody, regardless of place. That's very, very different. Philosophically, that's a shift from the MDGs, okay? which never said that they're going to be looking at as an attempt to get rid of poverty. The second thing, and that's that, that next point, is, is that politically, within the SDGs, there is an overt focus on inequality as well as poverty. Okay? And that, that politically is different, analytically that is different, and operationally. Going to be very <coughs> For me, perhaps the most important transformation as an urbanist is that because the UN only invokes nation states, only nation states are members, it is profoundly different to think about the idea that sub-national government is important. In other words, local, we can call it global government, it doesn't have to be local government. We might be talking about states or provinces or some other designated form, and that is yet to be decided. And that, of course, is a really important question for us. So, you know, is the city region more important than the city? What is the city? What's the relationship between the city and local government? Mm -hmm. But the fact that there is an acknowledgement that nation states are not the only arbiters of development is profoundly different. So that's significant. I, like I suspect quite a lot of you in the room, come out of geography tradition. Um, at least some of your words. <laughs> and the other thing which really marks for me a shift in the SDG process is the idea of not so much the integration of the social, the economic, and the ecological, because that has been there it's post Rio, but rather the elevation of ecological constraints. It is a much, much more dominant discourse. The, across the SDGs, and it is fundamental to understanding the urban SDG. I would go so far as to argue that the people who actually brokered the SDG came out of the biodiversity community and the climate change community. They did not come out of the social development community. Or even the economic development community who didn't actually end up getting productive onto the SDG um, wording. So, you know, that's really significant when we start to think about the knowledge agenda, who owns the urban knowledge agenda, what constitutes development at the urban scale, and who the voices and evidences are that we might want to be thinking about that. For me, that's really fundamental. And then, the last point, um, which is what I'm least qualified to talk about, but is possibly the most fundamental, is that because there are so many new SDGs, and because new targets and indicators are being developed, inadvertently, an entirely new system of metrics is being proposed. Okay. So, the UN stats people are looking for new numbers. They're looking for how to present new numbers. The geospatial people are running a parallel process in the question of the institutional architecture of the indicators and the way that that cachet is down from the global to the national to the sub-national to the household scale 
will be fundamental. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. The one is to say if we don't claim that window very quickly, we will miss it. The other is to make sure that we identify the gaps in the indicator system, which there will be, and that we are able to align over the period of time to come the indicators that we require. I and mean, somebody gave me an example not long ago of the gender process. When the initial declarations on gender equity were presented, there was no gender data in place. And it was through the commitment to gender equity that it was possible to begin to introduce much better disaggregation of national statistics. So I think there's a big discussion for us over the next few days. The last thing I want to say about the SDG process is that it is a fluid process and it is not yet closed. Um, and that has real implications for this group. What does the NY look like? Where does it go? Who do you want? What do you think about what that means? Um, so I've already talked about the stats and the fact that they are under uh, discussion. The expert panel, and I suspect there are people in the room who are involved in the expert panels, um, I think will be more significant not because they will change anything, but because they, the reports which come out of the expert working groups, everyone with me? Habitat 3 has a, has a process. To inform it, it has a set of 10 expert working groups. They will produce a document which in theory feeds into the draft that will come out as the document. In practice, that doc the, the, the final document is already under drafting. Um, and it may well be that the most useful thing we can do is to interrogate what is in the expert panel documents to be able to resurrect it at a later stage. But those documents will be there and they are public, they are online, you can access them. So it's an ongoing process. Um, and similarly, you, you know, we, we've seen, and I'll talk about it, Habitat 2, nation states change their views. One can get political shifts. They got the UK government to come out in favor of the urban SDG at the very last minute. Um, they got the Americans at Habitat 2 to agree to the right to housing at the very last minute. So it may well be we need to watch carefully, not so much if the proposed document is boring and bland, but rather, if the document has things in it which we cannot live with. And that it seems to me to be the really important political task, intellectual and political task at this point. Um, oh, this uh, thing has gone uh, out of, of the way. Which means some of us probably have to go to the meeting um, in September uh, and to participate in these other processes which are underway. Um, in, as we going on, where there are a lot of donors who are having discussions about what does the post-2015 agenda mean, how do, some research funders, some of you may be involved in, in the ESRC and, and, and other processes. What, what does the post-2015 research agenda mean? Because that is going to click in very, very quickly. And getting the size and shape of that right is really important. Okay, so what I'm suggesting is we are inching towards what I think will be defined as a global urban agenda. Okay? People won't like all of it, it will be contested. And in thinking about what that is, I find it helpful to recognize that it didn't always exist. It's not fixed yet, but it certainly is much more present and tangible than it ever was in real sorts of ways. The other thing is, is that the sustainable development agenda, which most people are aware of, has been around for several decades, never used to have a focus on the urban nexus. Okay, so in the 80s and the 90s, when you spoke about sustainable development, notwithstanding Local Agenda 21, okay, one of the most interesting practical applications of the sustainable development agenda, whatever you think of, of LA 21, it didn't have a particularly urban resonance. It was about localism. It wasn't necessarily about cityness in particular kinds of ways. Of course, this global agenda, just because it exists like any national policy or any local policy, doesn't mean it's going to be implemented. And there's massive slippage between what is said and what happens. Uh, and the difficulty, I think, at the global scale is that trying to make changes is exceptionally difficult. It's hard at a city scale, when there are 10 million of you, to influence the London plan or the Lagos plan. It's really difficult to influence national policy on specifics. It's unbelievably difficult to do that in the context of the global. And partly that's because it just requires such extraordinary knowledge about the processes uh, 
um, and then to have a clarity of vision of what is it that you want to shift. You know, is the important thing the metrics? Is the important thing the leadership? Is the important thing basic services? And it seems to me for the urban community, the challenge for us is that I'm not sure that we ourselves have any clear idea, if you take Simon's point about integration, what is it that's going to drive an integration agenda? If you had to say what would make a city safe, what is it that you have? And what is your evidence for suggesting that these are the most important interventions that we should begin with in particular kinds of ways? And so it's with that in mind that I want to just go back very quickly to say how did we get here and to understand that we don't have to do everything today, but that if we don't do anything, things will happen anyway. Yeah? And so it's worth your while intervening, and if you can only begin to move the agenda two or three degrees, it's probably better than moving the other way. Um, and if you look at these efforts to create uh, a global urban agenda, for me what's important is to acknowledge that they didn't occur or begin with the UN. Okay, so the idea that we would collectively think about cities isn't a UN agenda. So for those of you who have reservations about uh, global governance, uh, useful to begin to think about other meetings. I like these two, they happen to be, the, the 1913 one apparently was more interesting than the Reba meeting. The Reba meeting was apparently deeply, deeply chaotic. Um, and nothing came out of it. People arrived late, didn't speak, the speakers didn't arrive, it was, it was hopeless. Um, almost nothing came out of it. The Ghent meeting was apparently a little better, but it was really a, a celebration of, of the relationship between modernism and the city, and they really were only talking about what went on in Europe and to a lesser extent uh, in North America. But for us, what is interesting is that at the same time, there is a long history of talking about policy across national boundaries to do with the city. And it took place under the guise of colonial policy. I'm busy doing some work for uh, a project on urban risk, and in fact the story is a difficult one to unravel here because it does seem that the most important narrative is one about why cities weren't spoken about at all. In other words, why they didn't think cities were important and why they focused on particular sectors. You might want to think about that now when we start to think about is it important to have sectoral knowledge in the city, financial knowledge, knowledge about waste, knowledge about energy. Some people would argue that energy is really what you need to understand the city. Or is it important to understand the city as a whole? And certainly when we look back in colonial policy, the one thing they had no understanding of and no interest in was the idea of how the city as a whole worked. Now some of that's because the cities were very small. Yeah? But it isn't all of it. And there's some suggestions that it's been this dominance of health and housing that have distorted the urban agenda in ways that need uh, to be rectified. Um, and we want to look at the legacies of that earlier way of thinking about what constitutes policy and policy making, what it's important to make a statement on. I've elsewhere begun to argue, and I see others are doing it as well, and I'm probably following them rather than the other way around, is to say, We've got to start thinking about our history, particularly I'm writing from an African point of view, not just in thinking about the legacies of colonialism. Quite a lot has happened since the end of the Second World War, since independence. And if you have a look at the independence movements, and we try to say, well, what was happening around the time of what was undoubtedly a global social movement of nationalism and of independence, of anti-colonialism? It has to be said that almost nothing was said at the time about cities. Insofar as the Bretton Woods institutions focused on <coughs> cities, they looked at European reconstruction. And we might say the same thing, frankly, now when we think about the fiscal reconstruction that's going on and the questions of where resource flows are being dedicated and where that leads to. It's ignoring the places where there probably was a much greater need for investment in particular kinds of ways. But that isn't just the fault of the Bretton Woods institutions. Nationalist governments had almost nothing to say about cities and city building in the 60s and 70s. And so there's a certain sort of irony here uh, that the people who come to the rescue uh, are the World Bank. Uh, and the Secretary of Defense, American Secretary of Defense, Bob McNamara, who takes the poverty agenda I'm sure some of the poverty experts in the room can talk about this much more significantly, 
takes and creates an institutional home for the poverty agenda within the bank. Now, this is important for us, again, to think about. Can you drive a global urban agenda if you don't have an institutional base? Does it matter? In other words, do you need a champion? And where is that champion? And does it matter who that champion is? Because some of us might argue that certainly in the early days, the bank probably did more harm than good in both its focus on poverty and its focus on the urban. And it's been an unhappy history, not just for the bank, but for a whole lot of other people uh, as well. And so for me, what is really interesting is that it wasn't really until the bank takes up the question of poverty, begins to start thinking about urban poverty, that begins to get this traction of an idea of something more tangible, more concrete, more defined of a global urban policy. And that moves into the UN, as do a lot of other things. Okay? The UN becomes the host, if you like. Um, and that's under the auspices, so you know how the UN works. So it's the Security Council and the Economic and Social Council. And the Economic and Social Council takes up a whole series uh, of agendas. And included in those is the Human Settlements Agenda. Now, the Human Settlements Agenda is not the urban agenda. Okay, just remind yourselves of that. It's the politics of the, what in, in African studies we talk about as urban rural continuum, circular migration, anti urbanism sometimes. Human settlements is that catchphrase. It's housing plus a few other things, and it's settlement because we don't really want to talk about cities. Yeah? But so the UN takes up and we begin these rolling conferences from the 1980s. So it becomes an important player in the global urban discourse. But I wouldn't want to suggest that it is necessarily the only place where that agenda is being held. If we have a look at what else is going on, we are also seeing, but at the same time, the emergence of, of what one might think was global NGOs. Okay? The ICLEs of the world. It took me a long time, I never realized that ICLE was, did you know that ICLE is an NGO? It's not for profit. It took me forever to realize that. SDI, all of these organizations which have transnational footprints and begin to be serious players in setting the agenda. Um, and we could think about a, a whole range of, of those. They come together, in a sense, for our purposes through the habitat process. And the habitat genealogy is a useful one. And I hesitate. You know, sometimes, you know when you, you go back and you present to your community that you've just interviewed? Well, I'm in that position now, where there are people in the room who have A, interviewed, and B, were there. So we'll take their comments and criticisms as much more authoritative than what I'm about to tell you. But I think for me what is important about Habitat is there, and Habitat One, the meeting in Vancouver, is that there was an astonishingly progressive agenda set. When you look back, 1976, and we have an agenda which is about participation and sustainability. This is before the Rio meeting. Okay? And those are the, those are the, the legacies, if, if you, you don't know, think of it in that way. And clearly there were very influential voices there, and those of us uh, who read in this area know the work of the Marcus the Alex, the John Turners of the world. Uh, and so it is unsurprising. There is also the creation of an institutional home, not an NGO, okay? but a UN agency. In fact, I'm not sure that it actually becomes an agency until much longer, uh, much later. It starts off simply as a project, UN Habitat. Uh, By the time the second conference comes along, and I know more of us were at that conference because I can see some of you who I was there with, uh, we've got slightly different intellectuals who influence the agenda. And that's my challenge to the DSA Urban Group, is to say where is the intellectual agenda that will um, set and, and, and shape Habitat 3 in particular kinds of ways. In some senses the agenda I think is less radical, it's an affirmation of what went before. That's okay. When some good things are there, that's that's all right. The really significant gap <coughs> was the question of the right to housing. Okay, it played out perhaps in unintended consequences, uh, certainly in places like Zimbabwe. Um, and the devil, of course, is always in the detail where the right to housing became uh, the right to formal housing and therefore the right to effect. Um, but I think there were very significant uh, issues on the table, livelihoods, assets, capabilities, and gender would be the things which for me were really, really there. And so it's with that in mind that I think we have to say, well, what is it that is nascent in our literature, in our thought processes, in our agenda setting, 
that would be brought to Habitat 3. And it seems to me that there are things there. The question of decentralization is one which unambiguously and that's both fiscal and political decentralization. And undoubtedly the question of land and the interface of land use management and other kinds of working. So not land as an isolated sectoral in question, but land in the sense both of urban form, the way that that impacts on uh, footprints and on energy uses and on emissions, but also as value capture, um, as access, as inclusion. So land, really, really important. Uh, and at both the intra and the uh, inter-urban scale. Uh, and perhaps this uh, provincialization uh, of the housing agenda, the dilution of the housing agenda in particular ways. So those, that's where some of the intellectual ideas are coming from. I'm going to speed up a bit. How much longer have I got? 10 minutes? Yeah. Yeah? Good. OK. <coughs> what concerns me is that in order to begin to make some of these changes, it's a, you need to understand how the system works. And in the early days, you just sent a couple of activists along to the tent at Habitat One, and they were there, and they stayed up later than anybody else, and they knew some of the good intellectuals, and they were connected, and they managed to influence. Now it's much more complicated. In order to speak at the UN, you have to be associated with something called a major group. Okay? And that was agreed at Rio, it was a, it was a concession that you would hear something other than nation states' points of view. And it was a good thing. At least everybody thought it was a good thing. And they defined who the major groups were. But in order to speak, in order to have representation, those are the conduits that you have to work through. Um, and there are, so those formal conduits, and then there are some kind of informal uh, support agencies that probably have undue influence. So the UN itself created something called the SSDN. You can get onto their website. It's fantastically useful. It's staffed with some amazing individuals who really understand uh, how the system works. And when they are good, they are very, very good. And when they are bad, they can block you. Yeah? Because they, in a sense, are the intermediaries. And we know a lot about intermediaries and they need to capture. So in all of these cases, it seems to me, and there's the need to capture um, of, at the top. You can see the glasses and recognize. One of the things which is incredibly difficult is that in order to speak at the UN, they actively re uh, seek out representation and diversity. It's lovely. So I have landed, as a resident of Africa and as a woman, speaking both on behalf of the entire science community globally, admittedly only for two minutes. But the science community had a lot to say. And on behalf of the entire African continent, for three minutes. Why? Because they needed to have a woman and an African who would go to New York who could say something to influence the members. So a lot of what we know about elite capture, we want to be thinking about uh, in uh, self-critical kinds of ways. But we have to use the institutions. We also have to use the leadership. And the leadership I'm afraid it does boil down to some individuals who understand the system, the moment, and how to set an agenda. I've already mentioned that, uh, McNamara and the way that the, the World Bank has opened up. That happened very largely through Barbara Ward. Um, they've still got the special advisor wrong then, uh, but who was a special advisor to, to McNamara. Yes. Um, but who, in our language, is probably much more influential in her role in IIE, and undoubtedly was the person who was the trigger, both for the focus on participation and the focus on sustainability. An individual who shaped the global agenda. Not necessarily directly, but who was brought in, how they were brought in, and how those relationships were brokered. And if you sit and chat with David, who I've said on a number of occasions, and I'll say again, I think has played a pivotal role in shaping uh, some of the global thinking on that, and the global institutions. He's not alone. I put Aram already there, who through David, at least in part, lands up on the IPCC. And the IPCC focus on urban, gives you an enormous exposure to how the UN works, to what the systems are, and an intellectual credibility to set an agenda. And Aram already was fundamental in the backroom organizing of the rewording of the campaign on the urban SDG, and has become influential uh, in setting it, and has now been incorporated onto the board 
uh, of the SSDM and is very influential in the indicator setting. So understanding that you have to have those people, but we need to understand how they are working. Institutions matter, leaders matter, ideas matter. I'm not going to go through the whole intellectual agenda and how fragmented we are at the moment. Needless to say, there are multiple conversations that are happening in the scholarly journals, not necessarily with reference to each other, often in very esoteric kinds of terms, all of which make the case for the urban, but do so in ways that have fundamentally conflicting, not just different, but conflicting policy implications, which are never teased out. In other words, as intellectuals, we have to take responsibility for the so what questions implied by the knowledge that we put on the table. So if you just take the first case, planetary urbanism uh, is very much the idea that cities are everywhere, in which case the decentralization debate doesn't matter. If cities reach everything from the stars to the bottom of the ocean, it's not an interesting and useful concept, it's pervasive, it has no political ramifications. Do away with the <coughs> urban SDG. By contrast, the idea of the urban Anthropocene, <coughs> you followed that debate about how we can now tell in geological time, because of the crack we lay down, that we have entered into a different geological era caused by urban living, has a very ecological focus on the understanding of why cities are important. That's very different from an ecosystem services point of view, which focuses on flows and on the way that urban areas and urban settlement and urban life can act as a trigger which will disrupt and destabilize a otherwise resilient system. So I'm not even going to work through the others other than to say we have fundamental conflicts, parallel conversations. And then we go to these poor people who have to negotiate through the UN system and its labyrinths, and we say to them, why haven't you taken our ideas seriously? And they say, yeah, which one? Yeah? Uh, where is it? Um, and it does seem to me we need to be uh, quite careful. And it's in that context that I want to suggest to you that for me there are three things which are really important for us to agree on at the same time as we disagree. And it's, the most important thing for me is to understand how and why we think cities are important. In other words, how important is the urban? And the first idea here is the idea that cities are simply a site. Uh, in other words, more than half the population lives in the world, in, in cities. If you're going to achieve any of the SDGs, you have to make sure that you achieve them in cities. Okay? That's, that's, that's one place of many, that you're, one place of two, rural or urban, that you have to address development needs. That's the logic of the site. The logic of the center is somewhat different. It gives greater weight to the city. And certainly some of the economic people argue this. It's the argue that cities are the centers of production. If you want to reduce poverty, best you do so in cities because it will disperse. It will flow from. The ecologists argue the reverse. They say cities are the center quite often of pollution. Uh, but both of them agree that cities are more important than the places that they surround. They, are, they have impact, they have ripple impact in particular kinds of ways. The last is the one which is, for me, the way that we need to be thinking about this, which is that cities are actually pathways. These are places which are catalytic of substantive change. It trans it's transformative change. It unlocks things which would not be that way if it were not for cities and city life. That can be good news. Innovation. Gender dynamics. Any of those sorts of things. In other words, if you change things in the city, you will change society at large. You will change the natural system in particular kinds of ways. And if you agree, which you don't have to, all of those make cities important. All of those things make the SDG 11 a good thing. But if you agree on the last one, it becomes really important what we do about cities and that we are able to begin to flesh out what this urban agenda needs to be. And so these are the last two slides. It seems to me then we are left with three big or four big questions. The first one is, can Habitat 3 provide a truly urban paradigm? I suspect the answer for most of us is probably not. It's going to land up being the narrower version of how do we implement the fairly narrow reporting structures of the SDG. If Habitat 3 isn't going to do everything we need it to do, it isn't um, 
salvation, then for me there are more profound kinds of questions of who holds the intellectual leadership? Who holds leadership per se on the political <coughs> question? Undoubtedly that means a role for science, uh, and I think some of the big funders are thinking about that. Uh, but whether we are as scholars thinking about that adequately, uh, so future Earth would be one vehicle, but perhaps they haven't got all the answers that come out of a very particular paradigm. Uh, we can talk about in, in other ways. Many people would argue that human habitat has not been an appropriate vehicle, even for a human settlement agenda. In other words, that it has failed in significant ways. So if we are now saying, you didn't do very well on the narrow mandate, and now we've got a really important mandate, is human habitat it? And if human habitat is not it, is it somewhere else in the UN? Or is it not in the UN? Is that an inappropriate place? given what we understand the urban agenda to be. It seems to me to be a really important question. Some people are suggesting that we buy some time by creating an IPCC uh, on urban questions, and we might want to think about what that means and what that might mean for the scholarly community. I do want to highlight the question of the indicators, partly because that will happen and is going to happen. Um, so as a matter of urgency, it seems to me that the agreement on that is something we need to be interrogating. Those of you who have the skill set uh, to take on those questions, and it isn't everybody. If you come out of a lovely anthropological tradition of doing ethnographic work, um, and you've produced amazing insights, you're not going to be a hell of a lot of who's talking uh, on this stuff. So we need to find the people who, who do have uh, those skills. And similarly, we need to have the people who have the skills to be able to start talking about the really important questions, which is where's all the money going to come from? What is the financial agenda? And does it matter whether we have municipal bonds or not? Does it matter uh, whether we have uh, individual home ownership or some other scheme? And we know that it does because we've seen the implications. And in fact, the very real consequences of home ownership and crisis are an example of precisely why cities are pathways and catalytic of much wider transformations. But it does seem to me that the way that we've undertaken the urban agenda uh, at least in the academy, has left us ill-prepared to talk uh, about those sorts of things. And then I would end with a slide that says, and you've got to do all of this everywhere, and it is a universal agenda, but if it doesn't work for Africa, it's not going to work at all. And that's a numbers game. And you can see them, and that big pink thing that's growing at the top is simply the demographic reality of the conditions which are going to be most arduous <coughs> in meeting uh, the SDGs in particular sorts of ways. And so making the global urban agenda work is not something which is placeless. It has to work in the poorest areas of the poorest continent, the <coughs> poorest people. Otherwise, it's not a global urban agenda, and it's not universal, and it's not something that we should be endorsing. Thanks. Um, we will run until quarter past, so we're just 15 minutes behind uh, on the programme. So obviously if people have questions for Sue, um, I'll hop over here and sort of chair. Uh, and Sue, maybe if you can remain up here for 10 minutes or so. <coughs> we may even get some questions online. Maybe. On the white spot. <laughs> on the white spot. So uh, thank you very much, first of all, said that was, that was fascinating and great to set the tone for what we'll be doing the rest of the day. Uh, I have one or two questions, but I'll leave them aside for now. Um, but yeah, we don't have to talk that long, so get your questions in now if you have to, please. Well, I will be thinking more. <laughs> but my question is just that, um, generally, as I understand it, one of the first major criticisms of the, of the SDGs generally was that they were completely contradictory because um, that emphasis on economic growth and transformation and the environmental and ecological uh, side would never work together and that the, the environmental side has been compromised by lots of the other goals. So I just wondered how you think that sits, that conflict sits within the urban goals. You alluded to the role of the ecological community <coughs> in kind of bagging that goal. But is that something that, um, you know, obviously those of us thinking about very poor countries are concerned with cities as engines of economic development and transformation of economies, uh, into productive economies, almost, that, that's, a, that's a very big priority. But in the same way that, in not perhaps the same way as in other states where they're just thinking about making the cities more sustainable. So how, 
I mean, how does that tension work through in the discussions around that urban goal? And do you see any way through it? Um, so, so I prefaced this at the beginning by saying I thought that the urban agenda wasn't the urban goal. Um, and I did that for exactly that reason. Um, for, for me, whether you are sitting in the global north where actually what your constituency is really interested in is the question of the economy, um, mm -hmm. or whether you are sitting in a city which has a massive infrastructural backlog, in Shasta, um, actually the, the economic question, you, you cannot take it out of the urban agenda. And, and so the framing of, of, the, of the urban SDG, having lost the word productive, seems to me to be very problematic. Um, which is why I would actively go for taking the goal as a whole and the economic question comes back in again. It does mean that you service the thing which we are familiar with as business. So how do you balance growth? One growth, churches we don't necessarily need growth. Questions. But, but the way that I, in my own mind, try to think about this is to say, so I'm a teacher, 